In October, he wrote, Dr. Parker is in Ninpu, but I am not alone. I have such a sensible presence of God with me as I never before experienced, and such drawings to prayer and watchfulness are very much blessed and necessary. So it was with renewed spirits that despite the comfort of a new place of his own and numerous opportunities all around him in Shanghai, Hudson Taylor set out once again for the regions beyond. This time he went alone and dressed like the Chinese people themselves, and the advantages of his new strategy became quickly apparent. His destination on this journey was the great island and city of Tsungming, which had a population of more than a million people without a single Protestant missionary. Hudson had been well received months before on his visit to Tsungming when his friend Burden, but the reception he received this time amazed him. At his first landing place, the people simply would not hear of his leaving. Those who had seen foreigners before had never seen one dressed in Chinese custom. This teacher didn't seem at all like an outsider. His medicine chest attracted them as much as his preaching. So when they learned that he would need an upstairs room because of the dampness of the area, they said, let him live in the temple if no other upper story can be found. But a householder stepped forward to say that he had an empty attic apartment. So within three days of his arrival in Sung Ming, Hudson Taylor found himself in possession of his first home in inland China. After all his difficulties getting established in Shanghai, this was exciting reassurance for the young missionary, almost as exciting as the response of the people in Sung Ming. Neighbors dropped in every day to the meetings, and the stream of visitors and patients seemed unceasing. Six weeks of this encouraging work, while it waked some opposition on the part of the Chinese medical fraternity, resulted in a group of regular Chinese listeners who earnestly wanted to learn about Christianity. One of these was a blacksmith named Chong, and another a successful businessman whose heart, Hudson wrote, the Lord opened. Hudson's own first Chinese convert, Gui Wa, from Shanghai, and another Christian helper were with him. So when the missionary had to return to Shanghai for supplies, the little group of new believers and seekers was still well cared for. But the heartening success in Sung Ming turned to bitter disappointment during one of his trips back to Shanghai, where he found an official summons waiting for him. He was to report to the British consulate at once. Unknown to Hudson, a small group of Chinese doctors and druggists in Sung Ming had pulled some strings. They'd bribed a local official to carry to the authorities their complaints about this foreign doctor, who was interfering with their work by accepting no payment for his medical practice. The Chinese official did complain to the British authorities, and the consul called Hudson in to remind him that the British treaty with China only provided for residents in the port. And if he attempted to settle elsewhere, he would be subject to a fine of five hundred dollars. Hudson pleaded his case, pointing out that French priests were living in Song Ming, protected by a supplemental treaty which stipulated that any immunities granted to other nations should also apply to the British. But the council said that he didn't have the authority to make that ruling. Any appeal would need to go to his supervisors. In the meantime, Hudson was ordered out of Tsung Ming and instructed not to, to transgress the treaty in the future. So it looked as if he would have to give up the successful new ministry that had excited and encouraged him so much. And he'd also have to give up that first home in the interior that had seemed like such a clear sign of God's direction and blessing on his work. Now we go to the years 1855, at 1856. It was a frustrated, heartbroken letter Hudson Taylor wrote home that evening. Those young inquirers at Tsung Ming, Tsung Sa, and the others, what was to become of them? Weren't they now his own children in the faith? How could he leave them with no help and so little Christian knowledge? He inquired in his letter to the secretaries about his responsibilities and limitations. Forbidden to reside on the island and finding that even traveling into the country and remaining for a short time is an infringement of the treaty which may be visited by a fine of five hundred dollars, 
I have thought it best to write privately and inquire whether in case I should be fined that the society should be responsible for the sum. Also whether, if circumstances should make it possible for me to go to the interior, giving up all claim to consular protection, you would approve my doing so. Should I be left free to follow this course? Or would the society object to one of their missionaries adopting such a position? Although the attempt to rent a house and reside in Sung Ming has met with failure, we must be very thankful for what has been accomplished. I have every reason to hope that three of those who profess to believe in the Lord Jesus are sincere, and if so, the results will last to all eternity. At the same time, it makes it all the harder to give up the work. Pray for me. I do not want on the one hand to flee from danger, nor on the other to court troubles, or from lack of patience to hinder future usefulness. Hudson determined to challenge the Council's right ruling by taking the matter before the British minister who was scheduled to arrive in Shanghai within weeks. But in the meantime, there was nothing to do but take his sad leave from Song Ming. My heart will be truly sorrowful when I can no longer join you in the meetings, said the Chinese blacksmith the last evening the little group was together. But you will worship in your own home, Hudson told him. Still shut your shop on Sunday, for God is here whether I am here or not. Get someone to read to you, and gather your neighbors in to hear the gospel. I know but very little, Sung added, and when I read I by no means understand all the characters. My heart is grieved because you have to leave us. But I do thank God that he ever sent you to this place. My sins, once so heavy, are all laid on Jesus and he daily gives me joy and peace. Hudson returned to Shanghai, and the even more disheartening news that the British minister was delayed. Any hope for appeal would have to be put off. In his discouragement, Hudson wrote his parents, Pray for me. I need more grace, and live far below my privileges. Oh, to feel more as the Lord Jesus Christ did when he said, I lay down my life for my sheep. I do not want to be as a hireling who flees when the wolf is near, nor would I lightly run into danger when much may be accomplished in safety. I want to know the Lord's will and to have grace to do it, even if it results in expatriation. Pray for me that I may be a follower of Christ, not in word only, but in deed and truth. It was at this low point in his life that prayers for encouragement both Hudson's prayers and the prayers of those who cared about him, were answered in a most unexpected way. William Burns, a preacher and evangelist who had become a household name in Scotland during the country's great revival in 1839, had also felt a call to evangelize the interior of China. In an attempt to reach the Taiping rebel capital of Nanking, he actually journeyed far up the Yangtze River before he was turned back. So it was that he ended up in Shanghai, where he met the young Hudson Taylor, who was still stinging from his own recent failure. Despite the disparity in age, the two men discovered that they were kindred spirits, and like those New Testament missionaries Paul and Timothy, they were drawn together in friendship as well as ministry. Soon their two boats began traveling together over the network of waterways leading inland from Shanghai. The older missionary had developed a strategy of his own for such work, and Hudson gladly adopted it. Choosing an important trade center, they might remain two or three weeks in one place. Every morning they sat out early with a definite plan, sometimes going to the outskirts of a city in which foreigners had rarely been seen, and from a city's perimeter they would work their way slowly into the more crowded quarters. So they would give several days to preaching in the suburbs, gradually approaching the thronging streets and markets by which time they were familiar figures and could pass about without attracting a rowdy, curious crowd that would arouse the shopkeepers' tempers or endanger their wares. They would also visit temples, schools, and tea shops, returning regularly to the best places for preaching. Announcing at each meeting when they would be there again, they were encouraged to see many of the same faces again and again. 
and those interested hearers could be invited to the boats for further conversation. Justice Hudson learned from his older friend William Burns, also learned from him. As time went on, the Scottish evangelist could not fail to notice that Hudson Taylor, though so much younger and less experienced, had the more attentive hearers wherever they journeyed. Hudson was even asked into private houses, while he himself was often requested to wait outside. The riffraff of the crowd always seemed to gather around the preacher in foreign dress, while those who wished to hear undisturbed followed his less noticeable young friend. Mr. Burns wrote about his experiences with Hudson in this letter dated January 26, 1856. It is now 41 days since I left Shanghai on this last occasion. An excellent young English missionary, Mr. Taylor of the Chinese Evangelization Society, has been my companion, and we have experienced much mercy and on some occasions considerable help in our work. I must once more tell the story I've had to tell more than once already, how four weeks ago on the 29th of December I put on Chinese dress which I am now wearing. Mr. Taylor had made this change a few months before, and I found that he was in consequence so much less accommodated in preaching, etc., by the crowd that I concluded that it was my duty to follow his example. We have a large, very large field of labor in this region, though it might be difficult in the meantime for one to establish himself in any one particular place. The people listen with attention, but we need the power from on high to convince and convert. Is there any spirit of prayer on our behalf among God's people in Kilsith? Or is there any effort to seek the Spirit? How great the need is, and how great the arguments and motives for prayer in this case. The harvest here is indeed great, and the laborers are few and imperfectly fitted without much grace for such a work. And yet, grace can make a few feeble instruments the means of accomplishing great things, things greater even than we can conceive. In which he wrote, He was mighty in the scriptures, and his greatest power in preaching was the way in which he used the sword of the Spirit upon men's consciences and hearts. Sometimes one might have thought in listening to his solemn appeals that one was hearing a new chapter in the Bible when first spoken by a living prophet. His whole life was literally a life of prayer and his ministry a series of battles fought at the mercy seat. In digging in the field of the word, he threw up now and then great nuggets which formed part of one's spiritual wealth forever after. A cultured, genial, and witty man who enjoyed singing William Burns proved not only to be a powerful spiritual role model in Hudson Taylor's life, he was a wonderfully lively companion and friend. He loved to tell stories and was happy to share the wisdom of his long years of experience with his young friend. As a result, Hudson's time spent with William Burns was as instructive as any university degree and far more practical. Because William Burns lived out before him, right there in China, the reality of all Hudson needed to be and know. If any man have Christ in his heart, William Burns would say, heaven before his eyes and only as much of temporal blessings as is just needful to carry him safely through life, then pain and sorrow have little to shoot at. To be in union with him who is shepherd of Israel, to walk very near him who is both sun and shield, comprehends all a poor sinner requires to make him happy between this and heaven. So it was that the two men worked together for seven long happy months. It was during this time, as they continued their travels around the Shanghai region, that a Captain Bowers, a Christian ship's captain, told them about the great need to establish a mission in the city of Swato. Even as the captain talked, Hudson began to feel the calling of God to that great southern port to which no missionaries had ever gone. But he resisted the feeling for some time because he dreaded the thought of parting from his friend. Finally, the evening came when he could resist his sense of calling no longer. He later wrote about the occasion. I asked Mr. Burns to come to the little house that was still my headquarters, and there with many tears I told him how the Lord had been leading me, and how rebellious I had been 
and unwilling to leave him for this new sphere. 